Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today's International Podcast Day. So I figured I would find my favorite Irish philosopher and talk to him just for you. So uh, in advance of a conversation, I don't know what's going to happen. Let me tell you, you're welcome. Uh, I'm welcome, or they're welcome? They're welcome. Okay, sorry. I'll keep shut up for uh, a second. No, Pete, it's, it, I'm very glad you're here because... It's been too long. I know. People uh, are thinking we've fallen out over well, like gin and beer because you because you tweeted about it. Well, yeah, yeah okay, <laughs> you're just like, <laughs> oh, people thought, you, yeah, because you, you there's told a everyone. rumor going around. Of course, I started it, but uh, there's a rumor going around. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like when the person comes in your church office and they're like, well, you know, I've heard, um, <laughs> you know, people are saying who, well, yeah. Um, can say yeah my 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 thing and i've told ministers like if you do it a few times then you just stop getting people to bring it like the moment they say well they say or who you go okay look it's real important for us to keep things open and honest and i really want to hear criticism and stuff so if you could tell me i'll call um we'll put them on speakerphone and you just got to be as sincere as possible and how honesty and openness is important and you're really glad they're bringing it to you and surprisingly no one wastes your time with complaints anymore unless they're real very uh, nice. <laughs> uh, free advice. Um, so anyway, Homebrewed Christianity. Go to the website on Twitter, at Trip Fuller. And yours is? My website? In your, it's, yeah, in your Twitter. Okay, well, my website is Peter Rollins. This is really the depressing bit, peterrollins.net. Uh-huh. I did own .com briefly, and I forgot to keep paying for it, and somebody else stole it and wants to sell it to me. What's so, the price at? I, actually, it's not that much, but to be honest, .NET's fine. On principle. But you know what? People do look down on me. Peter Rollins .NET? What? Net? Yeah, Jay always slags me off about it. Well, I'm not going to pursue that. But uh, So before we jump in... Oh, by the way, there's huh? there's a guy I know. I don't know him, but he's famous. He calls Seth something. And he says, just, just, just type in Seth. If you want to find me. And true enough, I typed it in and the first page of stuff on Google is all about the guy. So I want to get to a point where I can say, just type in Pete. But that's not going to work. <laughs> so. Well, Seth doesn't have a Sether as an yeah. option. So I feel like half the time you're on the internet, you're Pete. Sometimes you're Peter Rollins. Yeah. It's like John or Jack for Caputo. Yeah. But the point when you can just say, just type in Peter and you'll uh-huh. find me is pretty, it's pretty cool. It, uh, well, I think I'm a long way away from that. Well, I feel like it's somewhere after at least 15,000 Twitter followers. Yeah. yeah. That's when, that's when it happens. Yeah. Okay. It's good. Mm-hmm. Or you could, or you could just buy all, you could buy Pete.com. You know what? Rollins is, is closer. Like there's only a few big Rollins. Henry Rollins will always beat me, you know, but who else? What other Rollins? Why, so look, many Rollins? I'm here to tell you that you have potential. Thank you. Henry, watch out. Yes. I'm starting to work out. The real I'm going to challenge him to an arm wrestle. The that, winner. Okay, pick a different. A different yeah. <laughs> I've seen pictures of him, and I've seen you move furniture. Let's go with uh, Henry on the arm wrestle. There is, by the way, if you type into the internet uh, my name and go into images, you'll find an image of my face on Henry Rollins' body. And not only did the person, and I know who did it, do it, they also put a tattoo of Bono on the arm. <laughs> And there, I think he's carrying a How Not to Speak of God book in his hand. <laughs> that was the real Peter Rollins Twitter uh, uh, icon. Yes. Um, but, well, anyway, uh, we won't pursue that one. But, uh, but before we jump into whatever else is about to happen, um, since it is International Podcast Day, we need to tell people about upcoming thingy-mabobs. Oh, yes. Namely, like a live podcast called The God Debacle here at the Hatchery on October 21st. Which I wish I could be at. Which is an excuse if it wasn't going to stream live on the internet, Pete. Uh, I'll be in Australia. Is that... Uh... They have the internet there. Do they? I'm not sure. Okay. I already know some people signed up that are in Australia, so I guess it is they a do have the reasonable interweb. time. Okay. Um, but, you know, you're, you're my friend, so I may even let you listen to it later. Oh, nice. Thank you very much. Because I know there. that that you are... Are you trying to charge people for it? Only, I, only if they're going to come... Live? Oh, right, okay, that's fair enough. Like, if you're coming to the happy hour part, I'm not going to give you beverage. If you're in person, then you pay to be one of the few people that are in the room when it happens, but everyone else yeah. online. Kind of like when we did... Um, Although it's a big room, are you going to try and pack it out? I or, haven't decided if we're going to use the big room or a smaller room. Okay. I haven't... I, 
A lot of it depends on what the internet is over there. Yes. I haven't tested it to see if in the big building it's a trustable streaming Because you know strength. what? The, the first debacle, the first big debacle was me and Tony Jones. Uh-huh. And that went really well, didn't it? Lots of yeah. people were interested. So this great debacle, and people like us. People like to see a fight. And these two guys were definitely getting pretty hot and heavy uh, on the internet. Um, a few months ago, and not in the good way. <laughs> These two guys, <laughs> Philip Clayton, LeBron Schultz, hot and heavy on the internet. <laughs> yeah, I, there was there was fighting talk going on. Yeah, so, the two of them. So um, who knows? I'll, I'll, I'd wonder how God feels about it, or if God has feelings about it. I guess we'll find out um, at the uh, the great debacle, which is neither a conversation nor a debate, but a debacle. Exactly. Oh yeah. Um, and then. Uh, I go to uh, Oklahoma before Subvert the Norm and talk about my book that comes out in November in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Then um, that's like November first, second, and third. It's a great book, by the way. If I was to if I was to lapse into orthodoxy, I might have to look a little bit like Trip Fuller, grow the beard out, start to enjoy beer, and think about Jesus the way he does. Very good book. Very well written. Very witty. Smart and well researched. How much of you didn't it, even pay me for that? I, I, yeah, but how much of it do you think was just your aura being in the house with me when I was writing? It? Yes, he was getting the blessing because uh, we were living together at the time. Yeah, people don't know this, but if you um, spend the night in a home where Peter Rollins is present, you wake up and there's gold dust. Yep. On your face. Oh, yeah. Listen, I went to a church where we did all that stuff. Gold dust, like perfume coming out of the palms of your hands. Uh, is that what you call it? Yes, that's <laughs> right. Smells very like sweat, <laughs> but it is definitely perfume. <laughs> okay. I, I got a lot more of it since I moved to L.A. Uh, <laughs> there must be a lot of blessing here. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's the city of angels. So, um, yeah, so uh, b- 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 I, before the day before Subvert the Norm, I'm doing a theology in our boot camp with Jack Caputo. And, wow. And so if people want to come early, it's uh, like no more than 30 people. And it's all day long, and it's how philosophers speak of God from uh, God who is transcendent being to eminent being to no being. Yeah. We're going to do like Aquinas, Hegel, Derrida. Whoa. And, what and you know what? Theology. Save up your pennies. We're giving you book recommendations here. There's Tripp's book, but also Jack's book is about to come out called Hoping um, Against Hope. Hoping Against Hope. And it is wonderful. Beautiful book. Really, it really is beautiful. So if you can get to hear him live with Trip, fantastic. If you can't, just get that book. And um, he's going to be on the podcast at Subvert the Norm because I have a whole game for you two to play. Oh, is that right? But you're going to tell everyone why we're even playing the game. Why at Subvert the Norm? And when you sign up, you can use uh, HBC STN, and it's the cheapest discount you can get. HBC STN. Like Homebrewed Christianity, Subvert the Norm. Oh, very you good. get your code as a discount code. Um, I see. Wait, hold, they're telling me thank you right now as they type it in. Yep. You're welcome. Um, so at the live podcast at Subvert the Norm, I, I have a series of questions to, to settle a debate I thought we settled during the Reformation. But we had clear lines on understanding human depravity. Um, and you and Jack have brought back up a good debate, the one between Stiletto and Calvin, um, and, and the nature of depravity or total depravity. So why in the world are these two radical theologians, Pete, as subvert the norm, finally going to settle uh, a good Reformation argument about the doctrine of sin. Ah, uh, well, I mean, first of all, a great point. You see all these contemporary discussions. It's weird how, if you look back in the history of philosophy, you can find theological versions like you know freedom of determinism has this kind of like roots in predestination or not predestination, and so. Uh, Tripp was the one who said, Pete, your whole big thing with Caputo over the original lack at the core of being, uh, a trauma that is constituted of being a human being, um, the idea that, that there is a nothingness at the heart of being and of being human, uh, this actually reflects the debates that were happening in the church um, about the idea of original sin, being born in darkness, and inheriting something of Adam's transgression. Um, and that was fascinating. So yeah, what you see in my debate with Caputo, because Caputo's all lights and fairy dust and, and everything's wonderful. He looks at a child and sees, oh, this, this child is 
born into a wonderful world and is excited and wide-eyed about existing. And I look at a child and see a child with ontic shock going, what is going on? Get me back into the womb. Being is horrible. Um, and, uh, and so that discussion about whether... Uh, you know, there is a trauma constitutive to being human is, um, is an important one for our positions. By the way, Jack and I are really good friends and our positions are very close and he's influenced me deeply. But well, this it's, is it's the like, one area. Uh, it, it, it's like you, you all, you, uh, it's like one little nugget in the woods. Yes. You hang out there all the time and only because you're in, interacting all the time does this one little area get turned into a big deal. Yeah. Um, but one of the reasons I think it, it does is because uh, how you understand the problem of existence greatly impacts how you understand relating to it in different, healthy, livable yeah. ways, how, it, how you understand even addressing, especially macro issues, like in the story, like how uh, philosophers and theologians have tried to understand anthropology on the uh, kind of interpersonal level greatly impacts how you understand politics yeah uh, because if we are this if we're fractured all the way to the core then most the myth of democracy is that that we're rational agents and if we're informed and think through and see the big picture that with this kind of inherent compassion and altruism of us good beings uh, when the, the, the kind of mist of irrationality and these isms that are bad, that are really based on our location and perspective and these, if we get freed from it, we're probably going to do the right thing. And what we need to do is harness the collective wisdom of people, um, uh, use, uh, science and things to, to clear away the masses so that we'll all kind of make, um, the right decision. And the, once that's gone, then, you, the, the way you see politics is different. So can you tell yeah. us, someone who's not just, you know, Peter Rollins, but you degrees like in, you have a degree in politics. I, yeah, philosophy. crazily I do. I have so, a, yeah. so how do you see like the way you understand the human being impact kind of the way we imagine yeah. politics functioning in the macro? That's a, that's a great point because, I mean, if you have a view um, that human beings you know that uh, there there isn't this kind of natural lack, this this uh, irrationality at the core of being a subject. Then you know you're more likely to dream about utopias, as as Trip saying. You're more likely to imagine a world that's you know we're we're moving teleologically to some sort of potentially um, you know just society that where where everything is can be you know not perfect. You know, there may be still be death, but but. At a, at a core level, we can really get rid of um, the irrational part of being human, the traumas that are to do with being human, and, 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 and someday enter into a type of utopic existence. Um, if you take a more Freudian kind of approach and see uh, consciousness as, as involving some sort of uh, uh, trauma and lack, then you're going to say that all of these utopic visions are ultimately dystopic, um, that they lead to uh, great violence and great problems. And actually the, the task is to work towards a better society, but realizing that um, there is something inherent um, to being human which prevents us from achieving uh, some absolute end goal. I mean, this might be the difference between Shizek and Caputo, by the way. You, you know, it might turn out that their slightly different political uh, views of the world are related to this question of lack and well, trauma. I, I wonder, a lot of it has to do with uh, how you see, how you answer the anthropological question um, also impacts how you even see notions like uh, utopias or ideals, these things you're striving for. Um when you have a less than uh, completely depraved human subject, then the ideal is just that. Like it's something that sits before you and you're striving after and there's less ambiguity about it. Um, when we're rotten to the core or, um, I mean, and this isn't odd. Like you're super conservative theologically. This is Paul. And yep. He's quoting <laughs> Jeremiah. Like, like your heart has nothing good in it. Like it doesn't know how to do anything good. So stop, like don't lose sleep on it. Yeah. Um, although, because, although the truth is, as you know better than most, is, is technically sin isn't a moral category; it's an ontological category. Yeah. So whenever you know Tripp's talking about depravity or anything like that, it, it's actually important to differentiate that from moral depravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, uh, no, that's good. Yeah. It, it's like uh, the difference between sin as a state of being and sins, like these little things that people – like the moment you make it non-ontological and moral, then all of a sudden we feel like we're in way more control of it, right? Yeah. Like you can go, oh, cursing. Well, I have I've figured true. out how yeah. to get over cursing, and I haven't I, – I didn't curse for like two and a half years once, uh, and I was like an asshole. Yeah. There's nothing worse than your Christian friend that There's doesn't curse. There's something else you didn't do for a long time? What, I that's not for international podcast. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I I always I always said that like I I was like I found out after becoming significantly older that no one actually kept all the rules. Yeah, and then I did. So my internal in ability to internalize um, kind of uh, repress the wall, is very it, strong. <laughs> yeah, I mean like I you know I I always like to know that I'm better than other people yeah. at something. Yeah, uh, my ability to internalize the law um, and and perform it. Like a champ in the face of every other thing that's going on you. You were like Paul. You're like Luther. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But you there's had constipation. a constipation. That's the reason for the constipation. Right it, there. Well, no. I. The thing is, I always just save it till you would leave the house, so I could uh, leave it in your toilet. Yeah. It was more of a way of just letting <laughs> letting my uh, presence linger. Um, <laughs> and everyone's like, "Oh, that's important." I am really glad they shared that thought. Yeah. Um, now, anyway, uh, so the way it, because when you recognize that um, the brokenness goes to the core, then an ideal or this utopic vision actually becomes uh, an illusion that distracts you from the problem that needs addressed. Yes. Right? Then no longer it's it's not the surface of the city. It's uh, what's going on underneath it. The In Freud's book, Future of Illusion, I think is the best um, uh, way of – or Civilization and Discontents where he does like the um, – uh, what's in the catacombs, what's underneath the city, is these patterns that have been there the whole time where it's been built and rebuilt, destroyed and things. Mm-hmm. Those are the same patterns controlling it. We could imagine we now have a blank canvas. We're now rational. We're now evolving. We're now free or whatever. When you do that and then you pretend the surface of the cities where freedom's won, then you actually miss that there are these patterns and things underneath the city, they're actually the same ones that brought it to its end before. Yeah. So tending to what's below. What's below. You hear that, Pete? That was good. Yeah. Uh, I. Uh, it's I, like no one will notice. No one's going <laughs> to notice that I. Uh, the memory card was full. We had to see where it was that stopped recording and go back to it. And it's important to edit it seamlessly because this is International Podcast Day, and I've only been doing it since 2008. Yeah. Oh, no. You made a mistake on International Podcast Day. This is very embarrassing. Or... Did we do it intentionally to show people that because of the internet, a diversity of voices, even not perfectly polished ones, could come out? Yeah, you, even you can do a podcast, even unskilled you that's listening to this. Exactly. Because we, brilliant us, can do it. And the, the, like, you are even a pioneer of helping people that want to get their voice out there get out there because you're putting on an event called Soapbox. Oh, I am. Oh, this is over to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I am. I am doing it next week. It's, I know. It was amazing. Like, it, it sold out so quickly. Now it might be because Rob Bell's part of it. No. <laughs> um, no. Most of them bought tickets before they even knew Rob was going to be there. That is true. Well, because what I realized, is, well, the reason why I set it up is because actually, to public speaking is an art. It's like playing a, in a uh, in a band or something, and nobody would think, "Oh, I can just get up and play in a band." But often people think, well, I can speak. I can just Actually, get up Actually, too and many speak. people think they can just <laughs> well, that's true. Get, uh, worship leaders. Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll take that on board. But the thing is, people will get up on stage and not realize that actually it's an art. And, you know, in order to kind of communicate a message passionately in an interesting way, in a way that causes transformation. So I wanted to do some teaching on that. And uh, there's a lot of people who are interested in learning those skills. So I'm actually going to put another one on probably in March. Uh, uh, so, yeah. I well, uh, the, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it'll be fun. I think um, you're beyond help, but I don't know what uh, to do you for know, you, man. No, I no, you just got to be positive. Okay. Just kind of like encourage you, knowing that you're not really ever going to be able to do it well, but just pretend. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, thanks. Mm-hmm. And when you're at it, you know, just... Send some positive things towards my uh, water. Yeah. I mean, the first thing you should probably do is stop doing podcasts naked. It's really weird. I know, you, I know the listener can't see it, but for the guest, it's but really disturbing. I thought like a whole speaking uh, advice is picture everyone else naked. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, not the speaker naked. That's what you're doing wrong. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, 
That's except for the white socks, and okay. they're very good. Yeah. yeah well, I, I'm, I'm kind of like, I, I have to be really good friends before I share my toes. Yeah. <laughs> Which all that excursus is, uh, is, is good because we were discussing, uh, sin. Um, and, and I talked about the civilization and discontents, the Freud book, where he's saying, like, you got to look at all the issues and stuff underneath. Um, those are actually what's controlling things. If you think the city, this, oh, well, you know, the previous version of Rome fell and is destroyed, so now let's just build the new one, the real democracy, the real blah, blah, blah. Um, that ends up just uh, confusing things significantly. You've got to actually tend to what's below because that's the power of the movement and stuff that's doing it. Like in the same way, uh, Paul's like, uh, um, I'm sorry, John Locke and friends, human beings aren't free rational agents. Uh, you're actually a slave to sin and a slave to the spirit. Like, mm-hmm. uh, that you are occupied. And so part of becoming, uh, more at home with yourself, the world, and these types of things is, is learning to live with it. Part of even, like for Paul, the beauty of grace is recognizing that each one of us is, has like this undead agent operating within us. Like, it's easier to extend grace to you if I think that we're both infected with the same issue as opposed to, uh, he decided rationally to make those kind of decisions. And that's where it's coming from. It's not coming from these other issues and powers and energies that are moving in us that we're often unaware to. And if you, if you keep thinking that the surface is the problem, the surface is the area, then you have this misplaced concreteness on the wrong issue. Um, and, and so I, I think part of the battle that has been in the doctrine of sin and in political philosophy around uh, um, uh, what is it like to have a just, just society and things is... Well, who is it we're dealing with? Yeah. Um, and where's the issue? And, 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 you know, you brought up something interesting there. You're saying, you know, we're infested with something. And the question is, you know, what, what are we infested with? If you're talking about sin, and actually in theology, there's an equivalent, but I'm going to talk a little bit about philosophy. But, um, in, in a sense, Jean-Paul Sartre very clearly, um, articulated the idea that we're actually not infested with something. We're infested with nothingness. This is what sin is. Sin is a lack. Um, and he used these two terms, or he employed them, uh, the in itself and the for itself. Uh, the in itself is any object that's being, that just is, a rock, a, uh, a computer, a microphone, just what it is. It's completely present to itself. It's completely itself. Um, it's just there. Uh, a dog even doesn't think, what is it like to be a dog? A dog kind of is just a dog. And then there is what's called the for itself. And the for itself is any object which relates to itself as an object. That self-consciousness, basically, any object that says, uh, I am different from other things or can rationally reflect on itself. And the reason Sartre uses these two terms is he says that by definition, if you are for itself, if you're a being that sees itself as something, you are infested with nothingness. There's a, a gap. In order to know that I'm not the car across the street, there has to be a kind of a, a gap between me and the car. In order to think of myself as Irish, as a man, as coming from Belfast, again, I have to take a certain distance from myself and look at myself strangely as if I was apart from myself. And Sartre says, so just being human means that you have this experience of distance that's kind of hard baked into your being. And it's actually that lack that can, if we, if we don't deal with it well, if we don't come to peace with it, can cause all manner of problems. Mm-hmm. I uh, personally, I, 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 I feel glad that you read the book. Like I, I remember I gave you the Sartre, the existential under, account of psychoanalysis. When you were living with me, and then you are actually talking about Sartre, I feel I don't think I read that one, but I know he hated the unco- he did, he wasn't a big fan of the unconscious. Well, the, but you're doing the critique he gives of psychoanalysis in it, and that the lack comes in what German idealists would talk about the disti- when you have the separation of the subject and object, then you start to see yourself uh, as an object, which also reinforces your selfhood, like when you're able to kind of op- the for itself kind of distinction. And uh, as opposed to being like super optimistic and uh, excited about this kind of observation, uh, Sartre goes like, yeah, so when you as a thinking subject are able to see yourself as an object, just like everything else in the world, the first thing that becomes immediately obvious is death. And so 
the, the this thing that you hold dear and prize is connected to your body is has beginnings and endings just like everything else. So the threat of non-being or the threat of nothingness and things is uh, is what happens. I don't know um, uh, why we would have this uh, separation happen and then think what's most unique about us is that we're nothing like everything else we see as an object, right? Like you, st- we're not structured as uh, agents that are being threatened by non-being. We know we were born to suffer and die, and this we create elaborate fictions and stories to tell ourselves that we're somehow significantly different than the rest of. Uh, the things around us. So, so what? What's that? Why does he feel that's a critique of psychoanalysis? Uh, I mean, you can read the book. Okay, no. <laughs> I will. Well, I should re- read that. You we said talk Sartre. About that no, 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 but <clears throat> I only thought about it because um, the the. Well, I think part of it is that he was he was basically saying this that uh, psychoanalysis is better understood existentially than in a Freudian way. Like the architecture's well, I, yeah. Freud there, but then take. The kind of way he isolates particular things on uh, early childhood or or sex or whatever, and recognize that you no, know, that's an expression of the ontic shock, which can be expressed in a whole different ways. Like he art, he says, like if you take Freud and then take uh, the notion of of dread and Kierkegaard and combine them, things work out a little bit better, and it makes sense why Freud's observations function so well in the practice of psychoanalysis, but. Um, uh, but they, sh- but his, uh, it's like that one part of his theory was dwarfed compared to the larger part, isolating it on particular, um, things around sex or whatnot, as opposed to. Uh, well, I, say, I think, I think, I thought his problem was he, he just, he, well, I feel like Sartre might have, well, I need to look into this, need to read the book, but may have felt that the unconscious was something that psychoanalysts were saying the unconscious is a thing, is a something. And so Sartre was kind of like, Critiquing it potentially by saying no, we're infested with nothingness is mm-hmm. unconscious. But but in my reading of psychoanalysis, they're they're generally not saying that the unconscious is something. Um, so uh, you know, Sartre's Sartre's critique might actually just be a critique of of psychoanalysts who want to say there is a structure called the unconscious. Whereas for someone like Lacan or Freud, I think they would be very happy to say no, the unconscious is in a sense the um, the manifestation of the lack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know what? We should discuss another book neither one of us have read any time. Yes, I know. That's um, it. We should actually delete that because that's terrible. That is like the cardinal sin. No, no, it's a international of, podcast. Of, of day. So we did this <laughs> discussing a book neither of but us have read. This was our pedagogical <laughs> uh, uh, pedagogical purpose to show that even if you haven't read something, you can talk about it on the internet. Yeah, which is pretty much the whole of academia. It's just no, bluff sh- that you've read the books. Sh- oh, sh- no, no, sorry. no, no, no. We did it because we were. This was a very sophisticated. A way of encouraging people to one read the book and also um, to read your most recent book with you. Oh, online. Oh, yeah. Well, you like that transition. That was very good. If you are like most people who pretend to have read me but haven't, haven't bought my books or haven't read them, now is your opportunity to go out and buy the uh, Divine Magician and read it along with me. So I'm going to do like a five week course online, and we're just going to look at each section and go through it. And I'm kind of going to obviously explore what the content is, but I want to also get behind it. You know, what's, what are the thinkers that I'm drawing on? What are the deeper implications? And maybe even how it relates to my other books. Mm-hmm. So. And um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it just because I'm always looking forward to an opportunity to tell you wrong, how wrong you are. Yeah. And... Um, in front of people, it's more enjoyable than private. Ah, uh, yeah, because I asked Trip. He never said yes, but so I can do this in public. I asked him to maybe be my guest, a guest on the last uh, week to kind of like give a critique and uh, kind of for us to have a bit of a discussion and debate about the book. Are you are you willing to do that, Trip? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, um, uh, are you going to waive your usual fee of ten thousand oh, dollars? Yes. No, no okay. I mean, I, the discounts I give you are just significant. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you know, like I, I feel like as as a Christian, I like to always be able to give an account of the hope that's within me. And yeah, and after you've gotten everyone so depressed, uh, magic tricking them, I'm gonna tell them, tell them the good news. Oh, amen. So you'll be you'll be finishing with an altar call. Very good. Yeah, a little bit of just as I am. Invite people up. I'm, just as I am, it doesn't really work the way it used to. Yeah. 
Um, is it because, Delirious song well, or something? I, there Delir- might I'm be. showing my age, aren't I? Delirious. What's the latest Hell, kind of cool Christian band? I, I don't know. Um, Run the JC. Oh no, that was my friend's rap band. <laughs> my, my friends had a Christian rap band in called Belfast what? called What Run to JC. Run to JC. I can still, in fact, this is part of my conversion. They were there the night I came out of the cinema and like I met these Christians from the charismatic evangelical church and my friend converted there. And then I did it like about a week later. You came out of the cinema? Like yeah. they were outside protesting the movie or something? No, they were outside doing, um, was they, it the passion? They, they were, were like, did you see just how much blood jesus had no they were doing the pagan sandwich which is you know that where you have a you do like a little drama and then you have a, a line of christians and then the pagans come in and then they put a line of christians at the back and create a pagan sandwich and then start talking to you and i was caught in that but is they that were they rapping but yeah this is, this is one of the terms yeah um i learned to do it myself but uh, uh th- what you see here before you is run the jc and we all know that heaven is the place to be for two thousand years or more god's been knocking on your door waiting to come in to deliver your sin you know oh i forget that's all i remember but that was that was jesus rap that brought me to the lord well <clears throat> um i just hope they have a youtube video because uh, if I was listening, I would, uh, be... Oh, they're so happy because none of them, none of them are cre- uh, like Christian or religious at all anymore. And so, and I'm like, I wish, I wish, I wish I had a, one of their albums or it was the days of YouTube. It would be brilliant, but I don't. So it's gone. But anyway, I was thinking of DC Talk. Have you talked to them recently? Told yeah. Them that God's still mates. knocking at their door? I, I do. I quote, the, I quote their own lyrics back to them on a regular uh, basis. Strangely, it doesn't seem to work. No, I, I mean, I know I've, I've, I've read How Not to Speak of God back at you and that hasn't worked either. And one of them was a human beatboxer. So he would beatbox while they were, uh, you know, with his mouth and all. Mm-hmm. And by the way, one of them is a really, really quite well known musician, a very good friend of mine. I feel like I shouldn't say his name, but you should because he's a really good musician. Uh, Duke Special, very good Northern Irish musician. Check him out. <laughs> he won't be doing Jesus rap. No. <laughs> well, you never know. I mean, you had it in you and it came right out. Yeah, it came out quite naturally there. Maybe we should start Run to JC up again, me and you. Well, do you know, do you know DC Talk songs? I don't actually. I'm disappointed. No. I mean, I, I could, I can, I can rap. Like, I had a, uh, um, the ability to do all sorts of styles of music. Oh. And, and I could Christian rap like the best of them. Hey, we've got a really good rapper at my festival in Belfast this year called, uh, John Toby Sue. Mac? John oh. Sue. What's up? Oh, I said Toby Mac, like the Toby rapper. Oh, right, no. talk. This is like, this is a rapper from Belfast. Belfast is not known for rap. Northern Ireland is not known for rap. Really? But this guy is very cool. He's kind of, he's so, yeah. So he samples you too. Uh, <laughs> that, that's Southern Ireland. They all, you too. Oh, you two are playing Belfast in, uh, I think in a couple of months or something, which would be amazing. Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. I, I'm sure we're really getting off topic they're, here. They're, we've Bono's lost like, everybody. Bono's like, finally. Yeah. I, we're going to have some people show up in Belfast because Pete mentioned it on the Home Route podcast. Yeah. I, they're always trying. Bono, if you're listening, you're still cool in my books. So I don't care what it? everybody else you, thinks. You, you had a uh, very nice seats when you two was out in LA. Oh yeah, I was very lucky. I, I, turns out a friend of mine, um, is, was kind of like one of their people on tour. And so was able to get tickets. I didn't even know, but he was just in LA. And I was like, what are you doing in LA? So I'm touring with you too. Like, what? Um, and it was a very good show, very basic, you know, I, my favorite gig I've ever seen in my life was their Zoo Rupa tour. I uh-huh. saw it in Dublin. Fantastic. But this is pretty stripped back, but very good. Still, they've still got it. And the last album, really good. Return to form. I haven't liked anything since Zerupa, you know, since pop maybe, but I like pop. I like pop. Yeah, no, pop was the last album I liked of theirs. You know, before this one. The uh well, I'm I'm glad they they made you happy. Yeah. But, hey, what are we talking about, by the way? Come it's, on. it's International Podcast Day. <laughs> <laughs> we have the most meandering podcast for you on International Podcast Day. No, so yeah. well, you you um you left me uh and and went home for a month and a half. Oh, and I did. Uh, in, in there, I see on the internet that, that you attended the Last Supper. I did. I did. I, for anybody who doesn't know this, which will be the majority of you, I years ago set up an event called the Last Supper. Once a month, we would get together in an upper room, 12 of us, uh, food and wine, and we'd invite a guest to come and talk about what they believed and why they believed it. 
And if we didn't like what they said, it would be their last supper, hence it was called the last supper. And we brought in kind of controversial political figures, religious figures, cultural outsiders. And um, it was just a fun way to hear different perspectives. It was one of the decentering practices that I developed with Icon. So I did one myself. I, sat, I finally sat in the seat of the condemned, uh, and then 12 people gathered around me and interrogated me. Now what did, how did they interrogate you? Well, they were all very nice, to be honest. I, it's difficult sometimes to go back to where you're from and do things. Every now and again, I go back to Belfast, and it just feels a bit awkward. You know, I don't know. So I was a bit worried about this, but it was really lovely. It was like people I hadn't seen for years, great atmosphere. And I basically, I took it as an opportunity to outline kind of what I've been trying to do since I left Belfast. I'm mm-hmm. like, what am I even trying? Why did I leave Belfast? What have I been trying to do? Um, we talked about it there and we did it in a great little C.S. Lewis coffee shop because why did I do it in the C.S. Lewis coffee shop? Uh, because the subtitle of my book is Lord Liar, Lunatic or Just Freaking Awesome. No, but oh. that's a very good buy the book. Now it's a very good segue yeah. back to your book. Well done. <laughs> because C.S. Lewis was a Northern Irish guy. He lived just around the corner from me. Uh, he lived right next door to my friend. Uh, but like that was the house, Little Lee. Um, so there's a little C.S. Lewis coffee shop called The Lamppost in East Belfast, and we did it there. So if you're ever in Belfast, go to The Lamppost. Ah. Mm-hmm. Is it? Is the wardrobe next door? They, they've got the door. The front door is like a wardrobe, and they've got like coats and stuff. So you kind of walk through a wardrobe. Do they do it like it. after he died? Because that would be a bit creepy. Like if you're C.S. Lewis and you go home and you're like, "Oh, look at this new," oh, but like after he's dead, like oh. and it's a C.S. Lewis themed thing. Ah, oh, this neighborhood. This is kind of cool, uh, letting people know. But if you went in yourself. Oh yeah, FCS. Oh, you know he was in there recently, but a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was a uh, uh, Van Morrison. Van Morrison. Like, like Van, Van Morrison, Morrison is another Northern Irish guy, and he still lives there. Oh, and one final thing, I was taking a walk uh, when I was back in Belfast in these beautiful wooded uh, kind of woodlands in a place called Crawfordsburn. Did and Santa Claus come up? No, like but you it? know what? I was looking at it, and it was like this is must be what Narnia is like. And then my friend said, actually. This is the place where C.S. Lewis was inspired to write Narnia. These were the, the this forest is is what he imagined Narnia to look like. There you go. So you need to come to Belfast. You see, not only that Game of Thrones and stuff. Belfast is buzzing at the moment. All sorts of fantasy things with swords. Yeah, that's that's why uh, I don't know if anyone you know you've told anyone that your next book um, is called is it, the is Big it Guide Other of Belfast. No, it's called <laughs> the Big Other and My Big Sword. Yes. And it's like you're trying to do psychoanalysis with fantasy. And there's a whole guide at the end. Like instead of decentering practices, uh Pete kind of develops how to LARP Lacanian. And uh live I don't even know role, what LARP means. live action role play. You know, <laughs> well, when you okay. when you wear the costumes and instead of like rolling dice like playing Dungeons and Dragons, you act it out. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I was told growing up though. That when you like Dungeons and Dragons was like the gateway drug to LARPing. I did play Dungeons and Dragons a lot. That explains that was the gateway drug to having no friends and not having a girlfriend. It was pretty much it was it was the gateway to being alone. Uh, Well, I I don't know. I mean, I've heard I've heard like there's nothing like a a D20 to bring the ladies around. Yeah, that's right. A hit point fourteen. Yeah, that would be a twenty sided dice. Just to clarify, if you don't know, and I'm sorry, but um, uh, yeah, so. Um, one of the one of the questions uh, I, I thought about bringing up, just because it was one of the more entertaining conversations I've ever uh, heard you have and had nothing to contribute, um, was your rather rather uh, uh, debate you and Bo had about casting out demons. <laughs> she liked to bring that up. No, but I I um, because like y'all, there were different styles of casting out demons, like methods, um, and. And you both are not currently demon caster outers, but it was like all of a sudden you were arguing about the best early nineties grunge music. You're like <laughs> Pearl Jam's better than Stone Temple Pilots. No, Stone Temple Pilots is better than Pearl Jam. Blah, blah, blah. Like and it was it was super intense. Um I was just an amateur exorcist. I wasn't a pro. You know, I did a I did a few in my day, but But I actually had someone ask, like, so like, you know, I've been reading uh, radical theology and stuff and blah 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 and like what do you do when you're making sense of these ecstatic experiences um, for, for more charismatic things I'm like I don't know I wasn't I really wasn't charismatic um, and I was like but um, Pete could talk about it 
So yeah. You don't have to talk about casting out demons, but how, <laughs> like, in thinking back to the, the, the Last Supper and, um, what kind of led to you to, uh, from your post cinema pagan sandwich conversion to, uh, a grad school icon and coming out here, like, how does your own kind of philosophical quest have you re-understand yeah. experiences that were intense and real or understood in a real different way when you yeah. had them? Well, th- this is probably why I was always drawn to continental philosophy, even though I started in analytic philosophy. Uh-huh. Because a lot of analytic philosophers, they look, they take a, they take a step back from religion and they kind of look at it like this object. And they kind of, there's loads of arguments for and against the existence of God and that kind of thing. In continental philosophy, with, really with Hegel, Hegel went the opposite direction. Hegel was like, you know what, the most interesting thing about religion is the lived experience. It's the, uh, the, the being, what, what is it like from the inside? Almost like what anthropologists do with participant observation, where they enter into a community and they experience it from the inside. And they, they don't uh, like stand back and, and treat it like some sort of objective problem to be solved, but rather as a mystery to participate in and then, yes, reflect, reflect on in some sort of rational way. So I actually like talking about that part of my life, like, because everything I've done and everything I'm about is is really taking seriously the lived experience of faith and trying to reflect on that, trying to draw the best in it. Um, so it's like, uh, you know, in, in some respects, when I was 17, I was just talking about it there with the run to JC. I had a conversion experience. I, from the inside, I experienced this this transformation and I was involved in a charismatic church for many years and that had a very deeply subjectively transforming uh, uh, effect on my life and all of my work is about trying to reflect on on the good part of that to understand it and to help help invite other people into that and myself more deeply into that so all of that saying is, how do I reflect on it? I, it's like, I think deep things were happening. Like whenever I, I did an exorcism once, well, where this guy was standing up, right? And it was a worship service. And then it was like someone took a shotgun and put it to his chest and pulled the trigger because he just bounced back onto these chairs, fell on the ground, eyes rolled back, and he started to like speak in this crazy voice. And, you know, we sat there with him and we started to say, what is your name? You know, what is, what is the darkness in you? Name yourself, all that kind of stuff in the name of Jesus. It was like the exorcist, right? And he starts to talk about, you know, uh, rejection, you know, hatred, all this stuff. And we're praying for him. And, and, and what I realized later on is that guy actually who I knew, was someone who was deeply, deeply wounded as a, as a human being. He was very alone. He had lots of trouble in his family life with his parents. Um, he, he, his, in school, he was bullied. I mean, he had a terrible, terrible time. And what he was naming in that experience were some of those deepest parts of themselves that he, he hid from everybody, including himself. So he was always acting like everything was fine, but it wasn't. And this was an explosion of of that stuff he was repressing. And what we were able to do was pray for him and then get around him and care for him. And in a sense, that's an exorcism. Mm-hmm. I I wonder how you see like the relationship of uh existing within kind of a structure way of being or uh, um kind of a I don't know operating with a sincerity in a mythology versus externally assessing it. You know, like, so you've even talked about how um, even psychoanalysis, once everyone knew kind of the ideas and the theory and stuff, it changes the way you work, right? Like, like once you start to see versus the, the person doing it to the person that's the one that being analyzed is aware of the concepts and things, it mm-hmm. changes how it happens. Yeah. The same way kind of like uh, Christian... Uh, experience changes uh, from within when you have a very different relationship to the stories and the mythology and things. And I wonder if there's not a sense where human beings, regardless, um, have a drive to be in a place where you can operate mythologically. And that part of the problem of the Enlightenment has been to 
to deny human beings need to exist in a world like that to deal with those type of things, right? Like we always addressed as if you were taking those things straight on. Is this true or not true? Theist, atheist fight. Yeah. Um, as opposed to, um, do human beings have crazy crap in them? They have to deal with, heal, move on, wrestle with, and to do it, you can't go at it straight. Yeah. Like to get to the truth, you have to get at it slant. Yeah. And sometimes it requires this whole, all this narrative uh, mythology in the positive sense, not like, yeah. oh, we're dismissing it. Um, and those questions are unrelated to its veracity, yeah. right? Like, um, uh, and so how do you see that? Because I've wondered, in, in, and this is really a setup for you kind of explaining more about like the technology of pyrotheology and uh, you have that, uh, the course coming up, but I'm interested because like what, it, how are leaders to think of it, right? So as you start to understand more of the structure, then you have a very different relationship to its performance. Um, when the first time you start engaging in biblical studies, critical theory, uh, or philosophy and science and these type of things, the stories that motivated and framed things, you have a very different relationship to. Some yeah. people come back to them in different ways, or some people have to find a, a new mythology and stuff. I just wonder how you see our drive or need to process things in some type of mythological story and then how awareness of it impacts our use of it. Like, yeah. Does it call us to an integrity in using the stories or not? Yeah, no, there's a lot in what you're, you're saying there. I mean, um, you, to come back to the psychoanalytic point you're saying is, yeah, that, that there's interpretations that analysts might have in terms of, a, you know, like somebody can't have a relationship and then you find out that actually they they were abandoned by their mother and so they don't seem to be able to trust women you know and you, you make this interpretation and they go oh, wow that's really interesting and it, it causes them to rethink something in a very basic way but then the problem is if actually the person already has that interpretation when they come in and you go oh, you know why why you have trouble with relationships oh it's because of my terrible relationship with my mother but it doesn't have any effect. It doesn't work. It's not doing anything. And so Lacan was, was very key in saying, we're getting it wrong if we think psychoanalytic interpretations are designed to make meaning, to describe something. No. They're designed to disrupt and surprise the person, to bring up hidden traumas, to bring those to the light of day, and hopefully in doing that to relive some past trauma in the clinic, in the, in the theater of the clinic, um, and to be transformed. So in the same way, I would go like in theology, uh, theology has a similar problem. Hermeneutics is how do you interpret the text? The parables, what do they mean? Uh, what are the sayings of Jesus? To reduce Jesus to an ethical teacher or a wise man, giving wise aphorisms on how to live. But what if you say that, well, actually, the, the role of parables and the sayings of Jesus are often actually to surprise and disturb the hearers, to enter into their world, to take seriously their world and their mythology, but also to just take a sideways glance at it, to bring to the surface hidden elements of violence, hidden elements of loneliness or bitterness or darkness, to bring those to the light of day, because in doing that, that people will be positively transformed and healed. So that's, that's what I mean is you end, like, I'll take one concrete example. Uh, somebody asked Jesus, I think, what was it, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Mm -hmm. And so what he does is he takes seriously the worldview of the day. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? Everybody would have believed that. Everybody, you know, they were theists, they were religious, so not, not controversial. There is a commitment to the lived experience of the people. And then he supplements it. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's innovative. That's saying kind of like, if you want to know what that looks like, it looks like love of your neighbor. So it takes seriously the lived experience of the people. And yet, in a sense, it then brings up something to say, well, if, if you say you love God, but you don't care for the person at your door who's suffering, then you don't. Yeah. And it clearly brought it up because then the guy's like, well, it's okay. Now who's my neighbor? Right, uh, yeah, and then yeah. Jesus still goes and tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the uh, you see like that answer itself provoked that question, which was a problem. Like you know, what well, I, I, what am I supposed to do? Like I do these rules and stuff, and he's yeah. like, no, so let's do this instead of going. Well, have you even thought about caring for your Samaritan neighbors? Yeah, yeah. 
No, absolutely. And, and so we, the nature of teachings of Jesus were, were trapping us and bringing up stuff that we didn't want to see, making us uncomfortable, bringing up that stuff to the surface. Um, but what we do right from the beginning, we've wanted to domesticate them. We've wanted to, re- to kind of reduce them to some sort of like Deepak Chopra saying, rather than maybe seeing that Christ is fundamentally against wisdom and against ethics. I mean, this is, I did a talk on this the other day and, um, cause I, I, I was thinking of Kierkegaard. I mean, Kierkegaard hated the idea that religion or Christianity was ethical and religious. He even says the founding story of the Christian, Jewish, and Islamic faiths cannot be understood from an ethical or a wise position. Uh, Abraham hearing an inner voice telling him to kill his kid and then going up the mountains to do it. No ethical teacher would say, yeah, if you want to kill your wife because an inner voice told you to do it, yeah, t- absolutely. No wise teacher would say that. In the same way, the crucifixion is not an ethical or a wise thing. This is my main problem. Wisdom with- is against ethics, in a sense. Well, wi- I'm against both. I think wisdom is often... Inherently, or the wisdom of the cross. Wisdom is. of the cross is, yes. The wisdom of the cross is the kind of foolishness. of the ethic. Yeah. Now, this is my problem with, with um, progressives. Um, and you know, my friend Tony, you know, he wrote this book, Why, you know, why did God, God Kill Jesus? Jesus. Right? My, my main problem with the, the, the progressive attempt to render the cross into an ethical and wise thing is actually, I mean, this is where I'm more with the conservatives. They tell a story that is unethical and unwise, right? It's horrible and disgusting. There's something about that which at least causes you to be disrupted. That there's something about the cross that is inherently meaning destroying. It, it's a thorn in the side of it. So my, you know, Peter Abelard or anybody like that who's trying to, you know, massage it into something ethical and good. What if it's like a dream? We have a dream and it disturbs us. And the idea is, to work out why it disturbs us, what that tells us about ourselves. You look at the cross and it tells us about our own violence, our own desire to kill the innocent. But it also tells us about maybe our desire to, you know, find a way of, of, of redemption through that. So all of this to say is I think we, we have lost the, the subversive nature of Christianity that's not standing on the outside of some position and like an analytic philosophy it's in it but it's always disrupting it bringing to the surface what we'd rather keep hidden mm-hmm. so uh one of the things that i thought about when about massaging the cross mm-hmm. is uh you could do the whole thing on getting splinters progressives what do they do is they their their hands are full of splinters because they've been trying to massage the cross that's into very good yeah that's uh, very yeah. good like the problem is like if you're a progressive I was just you because i've been oh. thinking about how i was going to help you give better talks this uh next week at soapbox i was trying to oh yeah help you out oh yeah well that's key getting good titles you're good at this good titles splinters that yeah there's something in that i'll make money out of that one that's my next book actually my next book is called is maybe well it might be called this fulfilling your dreams a horror story (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) oh yeah i'm ready for part two though The, the erotic one's gonna be more exciting um so, uh, uh, last, last thing before we jump off uh, uh, that I, uh, that I wanted to talk about is, um, the, I mean, that recently the United Church of Canada, um, basically told a, uh, minister who's kind of been an open and out atheist, like, okay, not believing in God. That's, you know, like, you can have all sorts of other things, theories, but we need to at least go for God if you're going to be a minister. Um, thinking about that and then, like, uh, the new atheists are running the, uh, clergy project where they're trying to help, uh, uh, atheists, uh, come out of the closet who are serving in congregations and a support system, you know, like, so they don't like starve and stuff. Um, uh, how do you see, uh, those, like, those stories connecting? That there's, um, like, you know, communities having some boundaries or intentions or things they center around. That's one question. Then, like, the people that serve it should be free to be on the same quest and questions and stuff as we hope the congregants are, right? Like, uh, if you ask uh, any of the people at a progressive denomination where they're like, all right, minister, we're going to have to part ways because you don't believe in God. Then if you ask them, what if anyone in your congregation didn't? You're like, oh, that's fine. We want you to be free and be where you are. Um, there's so many issues that kind of come up with, and how does your kind of general critique um, of the way religion and especially in institutional systems function uh, address this dynamic of of uh, essentially uh, um, 
non-believing, outsourced believers uh-huh. uh, in the clergy. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's interesting what's going on politically. I don't know what's going on politically in that denomination that they're having to do this because in most traditional denominations, it's it's the unwritten secret that most of them don't believe in God, like Church of England. I mean, God, good grief, you know. <laughs> um, uh, it, uh, it's like it's like the Catholic Church. It used to be that if you were gay. The place to go was the Catholic Church to become a priest. That was one of the safe places to go. And it was kind of well known. You didn't say it, but the whole thing about celibacy, it was like, of course there's going to be lots of gay priests because that's, that's in that culture, that was probably the few safe places you could be. And then it changes and it suddenly becomes if you're gay and a priest, you have to kind of, you know, it's bad or it's wrong. When the unwritten secret was it was fine. Something political changes. So I'd be interested to go, well, what, what's happening? That Because he was well known, I think, for a while for being a night, a night atheist. In fact, i give you an example of the politics. I have a friend who... Um, uh, was with a, a seminary, and he didn't have the same beliefs as a seminary, right? Same beliefs or practices, and they knew it for years, and it was totally fine. But then something else came up, and so they wanted to get rid of him. So what did they do? They made a list of all of the things that he was doing and believing that weren't in line with their statement. Now, they knew of it already. They just needed an excuse to get rid of him. It's like in, in America, uh, you're always committing crimes. Uh, I, I don't know what I heard, you know, everybody on average commits two crimes a day or something like that. It's fine until they want to get rid of you. So, for example, I'm a green card holder. I probably commit lots of crimes that I don't know, right? At any point, if they want to get rid of me, they can pull me in and they have the excuse of, oh, well, you didn't fulfill this, that, or the other, therefore you, you have to get out. That's not the real issue. So my, I wonder whether the real issue is something very different for him. Uh, I mean, my thought is that um, I think the God question is a huge one. Um, and I think that people are realizing when uh, kind of like the social cultural dominance of the church wanes and then you let people um you know give them freedom uh uh tell them to question and doubt and wrestle with this stuff i think they freak out the moment they realize everyone doesn't do it and then end up agreeing with them. yes yeah right and part of it there's i think there's a bunch of different reasons like conservatives it's because of uh, more like the specificity, right, of what they are needing to believe and stuff. And then in more progressive denominations, it's because, well, they actually have almost nothing they really are thinking everyone does believe and hold in common. Um, but in both senses, uh, they, the assumption is participation in the church is held together by some shared beliefs. Uh, and the progressive church is finally going like, well, you have to believe in some notion of ultimate reality or something uh is is really evidence of i think just how um deflationary progressive theology has gotten like to keep people around and somewhat interested will believe almost nothing and don't care what it is right like uh so we we as long as you're thinking in some way or have feelings about it then you can do whatever you want like that type of complete uh postmodern relativism in the sense of like, well, whatever you want to believe is good for you and if it works for me or whatever, then you stand up in a mirror and find out that what works for people actually is just not coming and not believing in God and then the institution freaks out and they're like, well, what are we going to have now? we got to at least have God. we got to make a big stand on God because it really matters if people believe in God. Without God, then we're about our pensions. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and and like, it, yeah, and it's all, it's all part of this metaphysical, I mean, it's it, like if you think of Christianity in metaphysical terms, I think then you have to ultimately come down to a certain set of beliefs. Um, I obviously am coming from radical theology as a, as a different view on it. I, well, one thing I would put into the mix from, from the perspective of like psychoanalysis or radical theology is actually whether or not you believe in God is much deeper than whether you intellectually believe in God. I mean, Sartre was, again, one of the ones who said, like, atheism's really hard. So he took Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, he was saying, to be a Christian is incredibly difficult, and he wants to make it difficult. It's about becoming a Christian. Yeah. Sartre was like, to be an atheist is incredibly difficult. In other words, if you're going to... if you're going to, You can intellectually not believe in God, mm-hmm. but if you still act... As if there is these objective truths and you, you know, you, 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 um, you know, you, capitalism or something becomes the, 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 the thing 
the sovereign power, you're still, you're kind of a theist. You're still operating as a theist. You haven't, you think you're an atheist in your mind, but you're actually still a believer in God. So, uh, the question of, of theism and atheism is complicated when you think that if you go, that is more unconscious than conscious. Yeah. And radical theology says the role of Christianity is to make people atheists at, at that deep level. Yeah. Even, but they can still believe in God if they want, but at a deep level, f- fully taking responsibility for their lives in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, uh, when progressives have, uh, hootie doody fights about God, um, they're, uh, what they're, really doing is collectively wanting to preserve their place as like the moral arbiters for the bourgeois. Yeah. Like, and, you know, yeah. And, you, and they're losing out to higher consciousness and mindfulness movements that are, I mean, I've been looking into that a bit recently and what, what's going on in those circles. They talk about God in terms of higher power, higher consciousness, all of this kind of stuff and, and fullness and complete and, and all the, the, the language of progressives is there um, but that's the people are flocking to that stuff. People aren't flocking to progressive churches. They're flocking to hearing these um, big, uh, you know, uh, higher consciousness speakers who are talking about oneness with the divine and all of this. Um, I actually think Christianity um, has something much more interesting to say than that. Uh, but progressives for me sound an awful lot like that, which is, you know, there's a higher power you believe in and also there is wisdom and try and be a good ethical person and, and all of that. Yeah. And, and a lot of it is Christianity without the cross. And I mean, I think that's, well, that's why Divine Magician is my favorite book of yours. Um, because it kind of insists on that. Uh, so the last thing before we go, well, without turning that into another 20 minutes <laughs> is, um, uh, the, your, the upcoming like pyro theology, workshop type thing you're doing in January? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Can you say a bit about that and, like, why if they've taken high-gravity classes, read your books, like that kind of stuff, what does the practitioner who comes to this rather intense uh, training um, going to be doing, getting equipped for? Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, basically, I... Um, I want to do two days where I hang out with practitioners and we talk about how to put some of these paratheological ideas into practice. So it's all very well doing the theory. It's great doing the high gravity courses. It's great reading the books. But when we talk about, well, what does it mean to bring doubt, complexity, and ambiguity into church life? How can this bring healing? Um, how do we kind of like bring more critical, uh, disruptive uh, uh, um, disciplines into into the congregation into Sunday morning. What does that look like? That th- those are the kind of things I want to look at. So this is not just academic. This is practice. This is practical. This is about transforming real people's lives. So I want to have two days where we hang out in LA. We drink together. We talk together, and we look at our communities and we talk about and how to actually bring some of the ideas that you've been exploring in the last lot of years on this uh, on this podcast and the stuff that I've been writing about for loads of years is just how do we do this? And it's on a Monday and a Tuesday. It'll also be interesting to, I think, some students, people who are theoreticians, but primarily I'm hoping that there'll be youth leaders, there'll be pastors, there'll be people who have been listening to this podcast for years, who have maybe read some of my stuff and go, yeah, that's all very well, but what does that look like in a sermon? What does that look like in worship? What does that look like in prayer or in a home group or in a youth group? And that's what I want to look at. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so, you know, check it out. Go to peterrollins.net because that's what all the cool kids get are dot nets. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and also just, just know, I, I recently discovered the app Blab and I found out today they now have, they just are releasing a co-hosting version of Blab. So, uh, which you should go get. It's like a uh, periscope, but four people's videos and t- are talking on the screen and then other people can watch and you can rotate who the other people are on the screen. Um, and, uh, I- I'm going to get blab and then, uh, um, Pete and I are going to get on the internet and then different ones of you hop on the little video and talk to us and we'll like talk to whoever's. Uh, Trip had the idea that we could call it Holy Smokes. So yeah. we would sit and uh, talk about holy things while smoking cigars. Yeah. So, well, uh, I thought Holy Smokes, one, like, it's funny, it's holy, we're smoking, and also cigars are very uh, Freudian. Yeah. And um, we're smoking hot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't want to didn't want to say that because yeah. it's a podcast. People, <laughs> but now that they've thought about just how handsome we are, 
uh, the experience of lack is coming into their consciousness. So you can, um, you can just, uh, you know, Google us and Google image search, uh, Pete Rollins, let's find his head on Henry Rollins so yep. that you're a little more buff, but then really sweet U2 tattoo, um, uh, on the, uh, I like that little addition. You know, the guy took his time to actually put, it was Johnny McEwen, put to put uh, a U2, a Bono face on on, on uh, my arm. Very good. Amazing, amazing. Anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, this is International Podcast Day. So I don't, I don't know what that means, but I'll put on the episode thing, or if you go to the webpage and click it, to tweet whatever the hashtag is for Podcast Day, so you should all tweet this from the website or to use the hashtag, which I don't know what it is. So you have to go yeah. there uh, to find out um, because I support podcasts. And I know I should start a podcast myself. I know it's like you don't have anyone you know that's a friend that could help you yeah. in the same yeah. city. And, uh, I, if only I had one friend who was good at podcasts that I could ask. You mean one that... that that's a, a recorder doesn't run out of space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In. On International Podcast Day. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Peace. Peace.